Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth edition of Taking Care of Business. You know, we've seen over the last couple of weeks a necessary light being shined on an issue of inequality around this country. And while our previous episodes of Taking Care of Business have focused specifically on the impact that COVID-19 has had on small business, I thought it was really important for us to have a conversation and episode focused specifically on the impact um, uh, focus specifically in addressing the unique struggles of African American businesses in the US, in addition to the impacts that COVID-19 is having on small businesses. We really are fortunate today that Damon John is with us and he's willing to open up and offer his expertise on both of these areas. Now, Damon is a person that doesn't need any introduction, but my team thought it was really important for that one person that may not know who he is to say this. Damon started his journey as an entrepreneur and business owner in his mother's basement, and it turned into his warehouse, and everything from production to inventory and distribution was done from there. Now his clothing company, FUBU, is a massive success and has amassed over $6 billion of retail sales. And that success has led Damon to be an investor on Shark Tank, an author, a motivational speaker, and the list goes on. So Damon, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, you know, you, we don't talk. Yeah, we, you know, we, one of the things that we don't talk enough about is the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on minority communities and particularly the African-American community. And that is on top of the, the struggles that the African-American community has already endured from systematic inequality that goes back, you know, decades and even, and even centuries. Um, and, you know, the, 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 these are impacts that many of us can't even fathom. Uh, we can't even fathom because we haven't experienced them in our own lives. Um, and one of the things that I, I would love to hear from you as we start is, you know, from your perspective, when you look at uh, African American owned businesses, what are some of the biggest issues facing them as they operate today? Well, you know, it's always going to be the lack of information or education that they can have in growing the business. Um, all, all businesses need definitely the fundamentals of financial intelligence, but if you are in a community where you don't trust the people who may have some authority in the communities or you don't trust you don't believe the banking system is in your favor you're going to shy away and you're going to just try to do it any by any way you can get it done so um education is going to be key and the the, the top reason why people are successful generally is mentorship um, but as we see, you know, things unraveling, there's a not, sometimes there's not often a lot of mentors in the community that people think that they can go to. So, uh, so those are the things that are really needed to help. And then people will understand how to get funding the right way, how to not take out things that are loans that are, uh, you know, balances on their credit cards and do things the smart way because uh, you can go and make all this money and then you realize that you weren't paying attention to the details because you weren't educated and you are losing money. Uh, so it's really, it's really about educating. Now, I mean, I mentioned at the top the, the way that your, your business has started. So you, you have successfully navigated through, through this struggle. You know, what, what were some of the things that you did? Like, how, how did you learn through this? I'm sure a lot of it was the hard way, but what, what were some of the things that you did specifically uh, to navigate through some of these challenges that face, uh, you know, people that are trying to start up from the beginning? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. I would seek mentors, and um, I would, uh, first personal mentor me was somebody that I used to clean up their, their uh, sweep up their grocery store, a um, little small store, and, and I used to always, uh, and I still always tell people, that if somebody was fortunate enough to keep a business, no matter how small it is, 20 years in the community, they dealt with everything from, uh, you know, uh, new technology change with the competition, food shortages and all that stuff. So I learned at first there, but I would also go out and I'd buy the books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill or Rich Dad, Poor Dad to self-educate myself. I didn't just depend on schooling. And I would then also continue to seek different mentors in different forms. Some who could help me with finance, some who can explain distribution to me, uh, some who could, uh, you know, explain marketing and, and things of that nature. I was, at, and I still am uh, somebody who uh, is thirsty for knowledge. And, and so that's, those are the things that I had to overcome. Now, 
truth be told, I opened a FUBU and I closed it down three times from 89 to 92 because I ran out of capital, but I would only run out of $500, $1,000. Then I got more people in the community to band with me and my other three partners um, to then say, we have one common goal and how are we going to accomplish this? And the community supported me. And then people of other colors supported me and that just kept growing. Um, so I've been really fortunate enough to, uh, to seek out mentors and get mentors in any way that I could. When, when you've gone through the process of seeking mentors, first of all, I, f I feel like that's something that takes um, a lot of self-awareness self uh, and maybe some vulnerability uh, as well as, as you're doing that. Um, like, what have you found the response to be when seeking and asking a mentor for help? Because I think maybe one of the things that prevents people from doing that is um, just uh, getting the courage to do it and maybe uh, the fear of rejection. Yeah, you know, and <clears throat> we grew up in a time where, you know, everything was glamorized on TV as, comp as business is so uh, cutthroat and competent. There wasn't words like collaborate, you know, when, when uh, I was growing up. Um, so um, I just didn't believe that. And I started to see people who would help me. Um, but I realized one thing at, that, at a certain point. Successful people want to help others, but they don't want to give handouts. So I, you know, like I would say to somebody, if I knew that they are, were really passionate about, you know, uh, animals, I would say, hey, is it possible I, I, I can go and work at an animal shelter for two, for, you know, for two hours or five hours a week? Is it possible for me to get on the phone with you one time every two weeks? And I'll do that on your behalf because the difference between walking up to somebody saying, I need help, I need, I need, I need, I need, and not saying what you can do for them, it feels like a handout a lot of time when people sometimes say, I have enough problems. But if you show that you're willing to learn and you're willing to give as much value as you can, and in return, hopefully, maybe you can spend some time with me or point me in the right direction, people want to help. You know, it's kind of that theory if you, you're driving down a highway and you see somebody sitting on top of their car, Often you don't pull over because you may think the person has a tow truck on its way, they're waiting for somebody, whatever the case is, but you drive down a highway and you see somebody pushing a car, people get out and push, right? Um, so we just got to be uh, responsible about how you approach mentors and the people in your life who can help you. Um, when, when you combine, you know, some of the things that you talked about with the situation that we're currently in, particularly a lot of communities that are, that are in with, um, you know, I, li I live in Seattle and we, and we just recently came out from under a total stay at home order. So when you, when you combine like trying to build up a business, starting to get a business, still seeking out mentorship, combined with being some places on a complete lockdown, you know, what, what, are, what, what, are, what are some of the advice that you give to businesses that, you know, have these multiple obstacles around them? How, can, how do you, how do, uh, you know, how can they find the inspiration to keep going? You know, I wish I can tell everybody that I have the answers to how to find the inspiration because I go through the, the days just like everybody who's watching now where I wake up and I say, is this dream over or a nightmare over? Oh, I'm going to go right back to my schedule tomorrow. And then I turn on the TV or I look at things and I see things that have altered. Um, the only thing that I can really say to anybody who is either a business person or uh, they can work at a company, what, what is your inventory? We can't necessarily control what's gonna go on outside in the world, meaning could it be a war, could it be another disease coming around or, or, or virus. And what I realized over dealing with the crash of 98 and then um, the dot-com bubble crash and then 9-11 and then 08 was the only time that I've been able to survive and uh, thrive off of that is I took inventory. How much time do I have on my hands? How am I educating myself so that I can move forward you know, who in my contacts and Rolodexes can I contact because, you know, they're right now in the same position that you and I are in. Everybody or most of the people, you know where to find them. They're at home arguing with their significant other, eating a bunch of chips and watching TV and trying to figure out what am I going to do? And if you would have called them three months ago, they may have been on a plane, train, automobile. They may have said, well, we're not going in that direction. They are all trying to figure out what to do. And that's your inventory. So that's the best thing that I can say. And I know a lot of businesses will collapse. Um, maybe it's for the better. Maybe they'll start a little, again, a little more wisely. Other businesses will find ways to transform. And they will say, now I need to be on more online, or maybe I need to collaborate with other people. And I've 
I've shared some some things that I've seen happen. I've seen a a, a great gym owner who said my membership was down uh, or is going to be down because people obviously pay and they can't come in. What am I going to do? I would advise for him to send everybody who was your member equipment and they're going to work out with the equipment. You already have your gym, your teachers, and you can film all very much like Peloton and film and they can work out from there. And also the stores in the neighborhood that are not getting any foot traffic, will they give your members 30% off or 40% off? Uh, and this was beneficial to their members. The store got to um, move their goods, whether it's juices or it's apparel. And the, <clears throat> the gym owner retained his members as well as made a percentage off of what the store would sell. And uh, everybody wins. But you've got to start thinking and being very collaborative during these times. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, one of, one of the, um, as you're talking about that, one of the things I was thinking was um, I've had a chance to talk to, uh, multiple businesses, particularly over the last couple months, um, when the, the pandemic and the pandemic was at its peak, and one common thing that I saw with businesses, small businesses that were uh, not struggling but actually succeeding during this pandemic, um, was was kind of what you were speaking to was innovation, was um, you know shifting around their business model in some cases or innovating in the products that they sell. And the interesting thing was a lot of that innovation was um, really sparked by the business making a decision that they wanted to do something good. And, and for many of them, it was, hey, we want to make sure that our employees still have a place to work and we don't have to lay people off. Um, some, some other ones were looking larger at their industry, like, hey, we need to give back. You know, we're in the food service and this is an industry that's struggling. And so we got to figure out how to give back. And it, and it kind of was this forcing function uh, to create and spark innovation inside their business. And I know, I know you invest in businesses that a lot, some of them have a, you know, a big a giving mission, like a Bombas, like I was going to show you my feet. I'm not wearing my Bombas socks today, but I wear them. <laughs> um, but I know you, I know you work with a lot of businesses that have giving missions. And I, I, um, I was curious just to get your thoughts on uh, how this, it, this uh, innovation, like you've seen it being sparked through, through uh, acts of good in, in COVID-19. I'd just be curious to get your thoughts on how important that is to businesses now, maybe more than ever. Oh, it is very important. First of all, businesses internally need to talk to their staff and see how their staff are doing um, and see if you can tap into those resources as well as who else do you work with externally? You know, do you call the, you, you know, when, when this first hit, I mean, we called up a lot of people that we work with and just said, how are you doing? You know, people want to know you care. Um, and then when you're talking about B2C, that's the exact whole reason you started a business. You felt that there was something that was lacking in the market that somebody else was going to solve the problem and nobody solved the problem. And you kept saying, I guess I'm going to have to solve this problem. And your customers who faithfully have been by you and will stand by you, you got to reach out and do the best you can for those customers. And I understand you got to take care of yourself as well, but they have supported you. And without customers, you don't have a business, period. Um, so I think the, 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 the first set of customers are internally, you know, the second set of customers are externally and also again, reach out to and talk to people, you know, business owners are, amount, uh, uh, they're under a massive amount of stress and the same people are under the same kind of stress as well who work in corporations, right? You know, we looked at the Anthony Bourdain and the case phase of the world and you realize that a small business owner, even a big business owner, they can't tell anybody their problems. Their employees tell them their problem because they think they walk on water. You can't tell your employees something like, uh, you know, I'm going to close the door next month because a lot of businesses are living still check to check because your employees will leave. You have a lot of financial stress on at the house, going on with your house with your family, and you're under a massive amount of stress. You've got to find also ways to communicate with people and tell them your issues so that, you know, you're mentally uh, prepared to take on the other challenges. Yeah. Um yeah, it's it's uh it's it's so true um uh, uh, there's a there's a lot uh of that that resonates with um with me personally and then also with uh businesses that i that i've talked to um you know what one one thing that uh that i've heard a lot of and i and i know i've had this kind of per personally in myself but i've also heard it in, as i've talked to colleagues and friends and coworkers is there's there's a lot of passion around helping uh, there's a lot of passion on helping, helping small businesses generally that are that are uh, impacted by what's going on with COVID, helping minority and African uh, American-owned businesses that 
are going through the, the struggles that are happening right now. Um, but one of the things that I, I feel like um, uh, I hear that may be holding people back is um, they don't know how to help or they're, uh, they're embarrassed about helping. They're embarrassed about saying the, the wrong thing. And, yeah. um, you know, what, 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 are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, you know, if, if, if somebody wants to help, um, what's the best way for them to help? Um, should people feel embarrassed about helping? Like, like I, I don't know if you got thoughts on that. Well, you know, it all depends on which way that you want to help. Um, you know, again, and, uh, you know, listen, education is the first way to help. Uh, but there's a lot of resources and tools out there that you can help. But, you know, when you're looking at, you know, the question is, you know, whether we're, talk if we're talking about an injustice going on, uh, you want to help in that way. If you see something, say something. You know, that it's just as simple as that. Um, uh, you know, helping uh, other business owners, it's going to be hard. You just need to, you, you need to let them know where the resources are, because again, they don't, they may feel embarrassed. They may not want to tell you. So you, you have to find ways to either go out and reach out to mentor them and find good organizations. I mean, I work with one called Nifty Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. It, 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 it's heavily in the inner city, um, but there are people uh, of all different, uh, you know, uh, colors in there and it teaches kids from like 10 to 15 years old what it is to be an entrepreneur if you take this box of pencils and you bought it for two dollars if you break them open and you can sell them piece by piece you may make four dollars and you can get more of what you want instead of having to bother your parents for it and when you see though their, their mind thinking they start to unravel and start to understand uh, how they can grow a business um, so, so first it goes back to education because if you don't get the education out to business owners and the youth and things of that nature, then the people who may not have the resources around them say, here's this stuff I have. If you sell this, you can make money. All right. And, and you don't think of growing a business like that. So uh, helping, uh, you know, first, I, I don't want to kind of go all over the place, but helping in the situation we're in where we feel that there is injustice being done is by Understanding that communities are underserved, and if you see something, really say something. Fight for them. You know whether you write it or you say it with your vote, or you or you or you you go down to the precinct or you call them and say, "I saw something and I don't like it." And on the other side, how do you help them get more access to the education and do more things like this? Where, you know, the internet is great and it's horrible, but the people that are watching this conversation will watch two people who are just human beings having a conversation, willing and wanting to help other people. And the color has nothing to do with our conversation, our conversation about two human beings that care for people. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, we, you know, we talked, we talked about, um, you know, we talked, we talked about mentorship um, as a, as a form of education. What, have you seen some other, uh, formal or informal uh, ways that businesses can get educated, some resources that may be helpful or available to, to businesses that are looking for them? Yeah, well, I know from one standpoint, I know the NAACP has a lot of stuff, Legal Defense Fund. I know there's um, other programs I've seen, like there's a company called Build, and they help people. Uh, um, but but I, I would go more into checking into the, the local chamber of commerce because every city, uh, you know, has them. They've been around a long time and they really are the voice of the people and they do show and help you get to, uh, you know, uh, educate you on banking and things of that nature. I actually didn't know about it. And there was one obviously in New York and I didn't know about it. So I think that they will have a lot of resources that people can learn from. But, you know, but the, the scary thing, I think, I think the, 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 the cha most challenging thing about people who don't have a strong enough education is like you said, they're scared or they're intimidated. They don't, they don't know. They don't know that when they walk into the bank, they don't need to have money to talk to the bank or the bank is actually there to share with you. How do you open up this business and the best way to do it? But they get intimidated by going, wait a minute, I don't have the money. No, it's there for you to hopefully grow and then make money. You know, uh, you know, so um, it, it, there's so many different um, things out there and we can obviously try to find some things and pull stuff. But Chamber of Commerce, I think, could be one of the best ways to to help people educate themselves on business. Yeah, great, great advice. Um, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is I was I was telling you before this that I just I had a chance to talk with a, a big group of, uh, of our employees and uh, hear some of their stories. And you know, a couple of things that really stood out to me. One, one, one and maybe the biggest one is um, 
how many feelings on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, basis with our African-American employees kind of get repressed when they come to work? You know, how on, on Monday they see, you know, horrific videos like what happened in Minneapolis and then kind of feel like they have to hide their feelings when they, when they come to work. And I know we have, we're gonna have a lot of business owners that listen to this, listen to this. Um, and, you know, what, one of the things that um, I think would be interesting to hear about and maybe uh, just talk more about is uh, how we can support employees that work for us. Employees that um, may have, I think everybody's got strong feelings about what happened, but there's some that with deep hurt and pain and emotion about what happened. And uh, I, you know, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear about your thoughts on how we can support employees that work for us. Um, that that um, you know, maybe maybe going through things, may have repressed feelings that have come out when they see injustices like what happened in Minneapolis. Well, first of all, having a very strong HR team who really is open to uh, listening to people, um, having a, a having some kind of. Uh, my daughter just popped in. <laughs> having some kind of um, you know having some kind of way to let them anonymously, uh, you know, and there's softwares out there. We, we have when we've seen them work really good, but have them a uh, way to uh, be able to, I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> have, uh, have things that they can honestly talk about what keeps them up at night, have some educational courses to also their counterparts to, to let them understand where a lot of these things come from. You know, um, I happen to be in a interracial uh, interracial marriage, and my wife never understood some when she saw certain things happen in a certain community until she was with me, right? And uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to my mother used to even though she was poor, my mother made sure I went to a different place every summer, and I spent summer every place, and I learned other cultures. And then my stepdad, who came in my life at sixteen, happened to be of the Jewish faith. And I realized two really important things, that love doesn't come in a color or agenda, and that people of other colors have their own problems as well. Prior to that, I thought everybody who was an African American walked on water and even, funny enough, I would think that, you know, when people weren't African American, when, when if there's no African American in the store, when they go in, everything's for free. That's how silly I, <laughs> I, I, I used to think it was. And then when I realized that humans are humans, and love is love, it opened me up, uh, you know, in great ways. And I would end up having a lot of relationships with, uh, you know, uh, business partners of all kinds of denominations and getting wiser and smarter. So I think that you have to be able to educate also the people who aren't of color and they're with some of the reasoning why things happen or have happened and where this uh, frustration comes from. You know, being a young man, um, I never, you know, even when I started going to school on my own, maybe like 12 years old, it was always the authoritative people in, the, in, my, in my neighborhood were white. So if the bus driver was mad at me and wanted me kicked off the bus, that would probably call a white officer. And then I would go to a school where, of course, I think one of our greatest assets in this world or in this, in this country and unappreciated, underappreciated assets are teachers, but there would be some rotten apple teachers as well. And I, you know, I probably heard the word, the N word in my life, I probably heard 50 times over the course of growing up by, and it wasn't done in a, it was done in a very um, harsh way. So when, when, when you explain that to people um, in, that aren't of color in your company, when you explain to uh, a person that, the African-American woman or father right there, their son is 16 and 17 years old, they don't know if they're gonna see their son tomorrow every time their son drives off in the car. Then you start to touch on a human emotion where people go, I understand. Now, nobody in this world wants anything handed down to them. So if we have to be very clear, uh, you know, that we're not looking for charity or anything like that and let other people understand that because, you know, the, the, the images have been painted around, the, you know, around the country has always been African Americans on welfare, they're this, they're poor, they're ignorant. No, they're not. And whenever you, you know, whenever anybody watching us now, when you have an African American friend who you love and you value and you hang out with, when you look at the other images on TV, you don't usually associate those images you see with your friend that you love and care because you go no well well lisa's not like that 
right? And, and just, and as long as you understand that none of us really strive to be like that and that everybody, uh, you know, just wants to do the right thing. So, so I, I think that it's two part education, you know, it, it, it's just when you give people a little bit of the history and of course you can also, you know, do something on the history of African Americans and to let, and then ask somebody to put themselves in that place and say, what would that happen? You know, what, 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 what do you think your outcome would have been if you dealt with all that adversity over the course of your life? And you'll find people are, people want to band together. I mean, that's the beautiful thing we're seeing on TV. Besides the the 1% that's horrific, ruining the protest, just like the 1% of cops that are horrific, everybody else is trying to do the right thing. And they're trying to band together. Yeah, uh, I love that. And you know, I think if, I actually think if there's something that COVID has taught us and me, me personally, it's that this, this human experience is a shared one. You know, we, ha we have this moment in our lifetime where we're all going through this, the same thing with COVID and realize that we're all people. Um, we're all people, we're all humans. We all, we all have a, a shared human experience. And um, you know, we have to remember that. And we do have to remember and, and appreciate the individual experiences that, that people that are in our communities, that are our coworkers, our colleagues, uh, go through themselves so that we can come closer together as teammates and colleagues and communities. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what you said. Um, and, and, uh, you know, something was just brought to me, and just before uh, this conversation, I was on the phone with my team, and I was asking them, and I was, I was sharing with them that a lot of times you're doing the right thing by, by uh, you know, by supporting and working with people of color and all colors, right? And you are out there on the front lines for us, but somebody brought up something very interesting. I never thought about it. Uh, one of my team members happened to be Jewish, who uh, also, uh, you know, is Jewish and Mexican, but he's Jewish. He said, you know, he said, until COVID came around, until this current situation came around, I didn't realize I don't have to wear a yarmulke. I can shave my beard. I can hide in plain sight. And, the, and people of color cannot hide in plain sight. You know who I am down the block, you know? Um, and that's something we just need to think about because even though a lot of us will have different challenges emotionally and but we are, this is who we are. And when you see us, there's an immediate judgment. Like when we judge anybody, the judgment could be amazing. The judgment could be poor. The judgment could be questionable. But just think about that. And a lot of people, once they think about that, it opens their eyes to think, to, to just way more of, uh, you know, the challenges. Yeah. Well, I think taking the time to understand that and appreciate it and um, really respect these, these experiences that, uh, people that we know, that we care about, that we work with, um, that we support our community go through, I, th I think is one of the big first steps to actually making some meaningful change, which, which I think now is the important thing is, you know, we have to, we have to move from conversation into, uh, into real change, into real change. But it starts, it starts with a conversation, awareness, and, and understanding. Um, Damon, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this um, and spending time with, with me on this, on this episode. Um, I think for everyone that's listening, you know, per, per what we were just talking about, continuing this conversation is incredibly important. And I, and I ask that everybody uh, take the time to reflect and be really thoughtful about how you continue this, this conversation with your teams, with your family, uh, with, those, with those in your community. And you know, for all the businesses out there that are, that are struggling, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I, I'd ask for those that are watching, continue to support communities, uh, businesses in your local community that need your help now more than ever. And if, uh, if there's any advice that we can help with, uh, you can always reach out to Damon or myself on Twitter. So Damon, thank you again. This was incredible. Thanks. I appreciate everything you're doing. It was great chatting with you. Thank you so much for your insights as well and, 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 and being a good human being. Thank you. Thank you.